Kip, um, lovely to meet you. Uh, thanks for taking the time to, to chat to us. Be, I'm so glad to be here and I'm looking forward to uh, learning more about you and, and uh, telling you a little bit about my background. Uh, all right. Well, look, look, I, I think maybe we'll learn more about you. Than, um, <laughs> but then, we'll see how it goes. Um, where are you based? So I'm based in Monterey, California, which is in the United States, and I live along the coast in what I think is one of the great diving areas in the world. Ah, uh, yeah, 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 I'm sure. What, what time is it there now with you? It's 9 a.m. here on the west coast of the United States. Fantastic. Are you, are you diving today? Are you going to get in the water? I'm not. I've actually uh, been out of the water for about three weeks now because uh, I had an engine failure on my boat, but ah. I got through. I got that fixed and I got my boat back yesterday. So I'm looking forward to getting back in the water. Um, last month I did go to Cocos Island, which is 300 miles off the coast of Costa Rica for my first international production job in about a year. So um, it was really exciting to be able to leave <laughs> the country again and, and go somewhere else and go shoot and dive. And um, so anyway, uh, other than, Diving close to home, uh, that's, that's been it in terms of getting on an airplane for a while. Yeah, the, the COVID has certainly taken its toll. It's, it's here in the UK, um, you know, it's been winter anyway, but haven't done hardly any diving at all. But uh, so much that we could possibly talk to you about. You know, you've done so much and are still doing uh, in, in your career. I'm just looking at a couple of things here. Um, Award-winning cinematographer, um, science documentaries, travel, and it goes on and on. But a couple of things that, that catch my eye right at the end is uh, you're ready to dive deep worker and deep rover submersibles to 3,000 feet. And also spent 17 days in an underwater habitat. I did. I'm sure you get asked a lot about this one. Uh, that is the most amazing thing. It's a thing I can only dream about doing. Can you just tell us a bit about it? Uh, absolutely. This was uh, back in 2014. I was working um, with a group of very dedicated people and um, the, it was called Mission 31. And the idea was to live on the bottom of the ocean for 31 days and um, with Fabien Cousteau, the, the grandson of Jacques Cousteau. And um, so I was slated for the first 17 days of the mission. And then I traded out with another cinematographer. And um, it was, uh, it was wild. I went through a lot of uh, training just to be able to, uh, be able to participate in that mission. Um, there was all kinds of tests to pass, including physicals and swim tests and all kinds of good stuff. Um, but uh, I, uh, I tell you what, it was one of the most amazing experiences of my life. I, uh, I loved being able to, to live underwater and then go out and make dives from the habitat. Sometimes I go out for three or four hours at a time which uh, most divers probably can't imagine <laughs> ever doing during their lifetime. Um, we even did night dives uh, when we go out at the habitat at night. And I, I guess I should back up and say this habitat is about um, eight or nine miles off the coast of Florida. And, um, and it sits in about 60 feet of water. It's about the size of a school bus. And it was established to help scientists be able to spend longer periods of time underwater to do their studies. But our, our space program through NASA also trains their astronauts there. So um, it's a habitat that's used for both engineering and science and discovery, outreach. And to be able to go and spend time there is, is very, very special. And so when I was selected to be a part of this team, you know, you can imagine I, I jumped at the chance. And um, I, I think in all, I spent about 400 hours total underwater um, at the habitat between all the training and actually living in the habitat. <laughs> uh, I can only smile. It, it, it just sounds amazing. Any favorite moments from that? I mean, what, what were you seeing uh, and discovering that you wouldn't have seen or discovered otherwise? It was, 
it, it was really interesting seeing um, the same set of creatures typically come by the habitat every day, you know, and you spend that much um, time underwater, you start to uh, see patterns and, and how um, things move and, and how they relate to your presence over, over time. And so on the good side, I saw eagle rays, the same eagle rays every day go swimming around the habitat, you know, and I see, saw a goliath grouper that um, resided in the area come by the habitat every day and there, were, there was amazing moments with them. But uh, on the other hand, I only saw one shark that whole entire time, which was a little bit disturbing. You think you'd be underwater for 17 days, you would see a lot of sharks and we didn't see a lot of sharks. Um, the two most memorable moments that I had uh, were one, of course, just spending my first night underwater in the habitat. And I remember sitting in my bunk looking out at, you know, this, this uh, illuminated portion of, of water outside the habitat that I could see from my bunk and just seeing these schools of fish feeding below the lights and just feeling, you know, incredibly fortunate, but it was also very surreal to, to be thinking about spending my first night underwater. And um, the second thing was um, because we were using hard hats and we were tethered essentially to the habitat by, you know, what, what we call an umbilical, um, you could go out and dive by yourself. And there was two-way communication between the helmets that we were wearing and the habitat. And so I would go out um, often in the evening after we got done wrapping up our productions for the day and look at this habitat from, you know, I don't know, a hundred yards away. And it was, it was astounding. It was, it was kind of like being on the moon, you know, you're looking back at your, what is essentially a space station, you know, on the bottom of the ocean and thinking, man, I'm out here by myself, you know, some nine miles offshore and looking at this, you know, big steel <laughs> house that I'm living in. It's, it was, it was really cool. Um, the second thing was on our last night before we were going to, uh, essentially go back to the surface. We had, uh, we got to watch an encounter between one of the Goliath groupers and a barracuda that got into it and started kind of fighting. And we made a video about it, but that, uh, tussle, if you will, attracted the first shark that we saw. And, um, it was kind of like the most amazing goodbye to the habitat. You know, we had this underwater show and I was able to film, um, that whole episode and I can, I can share a, a link with your viewers so they can check it out. Yeah, ab absolutely. L I'd love to put that up. I mean, huh. <laughs> I'm still smiling at the thought of, of even doing that. It, it's, and I love diving on my own as well. I much prefer diving on my own, just the thought of you being there on your own and watching it and at your own pace. I mean, how, how wonderful is that? You, um, we're obviously looking at behavior, I assume. Um, yeah. Any revelations on animal behavior, on fish behavior for any particular species? I mean, I think it's a thing that's overlooked quite a lot. It's, you know, you, you talk about shelling fish or aggressive grouper or mores sharks, but it's, it's a whole lot more involved and complicated than that. Were any things that, that you discovered during that time? Yeah, it's interesting when you, when you do have um, the gift of time, you can um, you know, observe predator-prey relationships to a link that you wouldn't normally be able to do just to, during a typical one hour dive. And so uh, we actually had two scientists with us during our mission and they were looking at how um, a common reef fish uh, would behave around um, decoys or models of large groupers if they were given a special seagrass treat. And so our scientists would bring in this really scrumptious grass treat and essentially kind of put it on the reef, attach it to the reef, but at the same time, hang a decoy, a grouper decoy off the reef and see what fish were willing to take a chance to eat that grass knowing that there was a large predator there. And so that was really interesting to observe, to see what species were, were <laughs> willing to take those chances and what, when which weren't. Um, on a less scientific type of observation, you know, or observations, I should say, um, 
Um, we saw many species that you would think would be more aggressive be just what you'd think they would be. Barracuda would come in very close and be aggressive with us. Um, grouper, same type of thing. They would typically come in, check us out. Um, but other species were, were still timid and shy around us, just as they are when you're blowing bubbles, you know, on your open circuit scuba rig. So, um, you know, I, I didn't have any super revelations along, along those lines based on, you know, the, literally the thousands of hours I've spent underwater. Um, but from the scientific standpoint of the experiment that I told you about, that was, that was quite interesting. But I mean, what about the inter, in, interspecies stuff? The, the, I mean, I always find science interesting, but I find science misses such a lot because it's science. <laughs> the interactions between other species and yourself or, or different types of fish and crustaceans, whatever, even in the short time I can spend underwater and watch it, I'm always learning. I'm always seeing how different species interact with each other and me. And I'm always seeing new stuff going on or it's reestablishing what I'd learned the day before. Anything like that happen to you where you think, oh my gosh, this is something I had no idea happened. Yeah, I mean, by and large, I'd say most of it was what I have had observed during my years of, of diving. Um, typically, if we went outside and we had lights at night and we attracted smaller fish that would attract larger prey, you know, those are the things that we see like on a typical night dive when, when you know, you bring <laughs> prey in for larger species that want to feed on those and they, they're opportunistic and will take advantage of it and change their behavior. I think that the biggest thing that we saw during my 17 days that really shocked me was this interaction I, I told you about between the Goliath grouper and the Barracuda. Mm -hmm. And the night before this occurred, I was filming squid right off of the habitat, off the same end of the habitat, and this Goliath grouper was kind of hanging out. But I had a very, very aggressive Barracuda that was essentially coming in and, and you know, had bumped me a couple times and to the point where it was getting a little uncomfortable to, to stay in the water. The night that we were leaving, the Goliath grouper that would hang out right up underneath this light at the end of the habitat and use it opportunistically to, to pick off prey, got into it with this barracuda, it became territorial. And I actually shot um, the Goliath grouper biting, taking a bite out of the barracuda, which was really amazing. I've never seen an interaction like that before where you have two, you know, kind of apex predators on the reef, you know, dueling it out a little bit. And it was obvious that the Goliath grouper was definitely, you know, the, the king of the reef after you, after you watch uh, the interaction unfold. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Exciting. My goodness. Yeah. Yeah, I was, <laughs> I was going to, I was going to ask you, Originally, you know, about your filming and photography and, and uh, stuff. And then I, on a website, saw your lecture, uh, Our Ocean's 20 Years From Now. And do you mind talking about that? Sure. Yeah. Sure. Absolutely. It, it was a superb lecture. Um, I enjoyed it thoroughly. A lot of information. Very good. Um, can you just uh, tell us briefly uh, what, what it was about and who it was aimed at? Yeah, uh, so I was invited by the Annenberg Space for Photography in Los Angeles to come and speak about um, my film and photography work. And um, anyone who knows my work knows that I've been focused mostly on underwater and conservation related projects during my career, starting when I was working for National Geographic. Um, and all the way up until my most uh, recent years with Mission Blue. And the presentation that I put together was essentially um, kind of a walk through the different places that I've been diving over the last, you know, 20 plus years and the changes and things that I've observed as a diver and as a filmmaker. And um, some of these changes are quite striking in, in some of the areas that I've been. Um, very few areas have evolved into being better locations. Maybe there's a couple 
um, that have bucked the trend. Um, but by and large, most of the places I dove as, for example, as a teenager, um, have significantly been degraded um, over my lifetime. And I, I wanted to tell people about what our, what our biggest challenges are in the ocean, you know, in terms of uh, sharks that are disappearing by the thousands, you know, and, and depleted, you know, tuna populations and um, reefs that are seeing huge pressure, you know, nearly 50% of the reefs worldwide are, are damaged or dying. And um, the oceans have a lot of challenges. And I feel like as a filmmaker and as a diver, it's my responsibility to, to share my knowledge and, and my experiences with people that are interested in, in making a difference or want to become more educated about the challenges we face. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's an interesting one talking about conservation. It, it, I learned after, after quite a few years, uh, if ever I was invited to a party or, or a social do, uh, I always used to find myself sat in a corner because people <laughs> uh, didn't want to approach the subject of marine conservation because I never really had any good news. <laughs> and uh, so I learned very early on just not to talk about conservation uh, at all if I wanted to have a good, uh, a, a good social event, which is understandable, but it's it's a huge shame um, that the majority of people out there, the consumers, again, who who really drive all this fishing and pollution industry, aren't taking on board what's happening. Yes. So, as a result of your lecture, who I, I assume the audiences were were, were very broad. What kind of reactions have you had from that? You know, it's, it's, it's really interesting. I think you, you have mixed reactions based on people's own experiences in the oceans. I, let me take a step back for just a second and say that it's, it's really interesting to be able to dive in areas that are not protected versus areas that are protected. And when I say protected, I mean marine reserves that are fully protected and have been protected for some time. You think about the Mediterranean, for example, it's incredibly overfished. I mean, you don't see large fish when you're diving in the Mediterranean unless you go to like a marine reserve, you know, that's been protected for 10 years plus. And, you know, it's, it's kind of the same way in here in California and, and other places too. Belize, Costa Rica, it doesn't really matter what location we're talking about. Those areas that are protected always have more of a resemblance of what the ocean used to look like some 30 years ago. Um, but we know now that those areas don't look the same. And when I try to explain that to people, it's hard, you know, if you're not a diver or a snorkeler, you, it, it's hard to imagine those things. But I think deep down inside people do care about the ocean. They realize that a large percentage of their oxygen they breathe comes from the ocean, or maybe it's the seafood they eat. Um, which I'm not advocating taking seafood, but a large portion of the planet gets their protein from the ocean. So um, it's important to take care of what we have there. And I think people can relate to that. Um, it's always that difficult balance between finding people who care, you know, and those who are in industry and are, you know, unfortunately either trying to make a living or make a profit. And, um, out there on the ocean, it's a little bit like the wild rust, you know, unless you have people who are monitoring and, and ensuring that, you know, the rules are being followed. It, it's hard to prove that they are, you know, and from what I see underwater, a lot of times it's, um, it's devastating. Yeah. Monitoring it is a, is a, <laughs> it's a huge problem. It's, yeah. um, I was saying to someone the other day, in fact, you know, I forget, I forget the figures still, but I think we have five or so hundred marine protected areas here in the UK, around the UK waters. And out of those, uh, I think 97% of them are still dredged or bottom fish trawled. But on, but on, so they're, not, they're not protected then. No, and, and on, but on paper... You know, the, the yeah. government says, yeah, we have, we have five, six hundred uh, protected areas. And you think, oh, great, relax, buy fish down. 
It's not happening. Nobody polices it and nobody monitors it. Do you do you find that's a common thing in your experiences, in your travels? Yeah, and it's really a, a, an amazingly frustrating thing. I think the areas that are well protected thrive. And the amazing thing is they also drive tourism depending on where they're located. And I believe that if you if you have a marine protected area that's filled with life, you will you will attract divers and tourists that want to come and see that. It's why should it be an anomaly? But it is, right? And so those areas that are paper parks where you know, on, on paper, they're protected, but we know they're really not, um, are, you know, I, I won't say they're worthless, but they're close to worthless if, if the rules aren't being followed and, you know, people are breaking the law. And, and we, you know, comparing those areas to fully protected areas, I mean, there is, there is typically no comparison. You have to have um, people, you know, might be rangers, the Navy or whoever, you know, monitoring and patrolling these areas. And in lieu of that, the probably in, in my experience, the best type of protection you can have for an area is community protection, where the community is fully invested in protecting their coastal resources and their body of water. It's their future, right? You know, especially if it's their livelihood. Yeah, I, absolutely. And as you're saying, t tourism, uh, you know, should have a great pull in in that area but it doesn't seem to and once again here in the uk uh because we're in a temperate uh water area the underwater and marine life isn't high up on the tourist agenda so it's um the the people that rule this are the fishing industries so that's where all the facts and things yeah. come from that makes it difficult um and, it, you know, I just like to make a point that that's probably one of the most frustrating things for me um, and, and you and people who, you know, explore and work in the ocean is that the oceans belong to all of us, not, not just the fishermen, right? Why do they have the right to take everything out? And um, I think we should have more power and more say. I think, it, it, you know, just like any democracy, there should, should be a better process for protecting the ocean and and not those people who are just exploiting the resources. And I'm not saying that all fishermen are bad. Please don't get me wrong there. I know that, you know, people need to make a living and we, and people eat fish, um, but there needs to be balance. Right. And I would like my small percentage of the ocean to be protected, right. To protect those species that are so vital, you know, for the health of our planet, you know, the health of our oceans. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. It was interesting at the end of your lecture, um, there was one question, uh, a lady said, should I still eat seafood or, or fish? And you mentioned uh, an app, uh, I forget who it was from, um, but gave sustainable uh, fish you could eat. Right. And we have the same thing in, in here in the UK. The, uh, I think it's the Marine Conservation Society. It has an app for a sustainable food, fish food. And I believe your answer was exactly the same as mine. It, it, all that does is it still promotes fishing uh, in target species, forgetting that they are part of a very delicate ecosystem. Yes. So once you hammer them and you move them out of the way, nothing is sustainable at all, really. And I mean, I'm not sure what your final answer was, but I mean, personally, I, I don't, I can't eat seafood um, at all. I just have to make that stand and leave it be. Um, is that the same for you? Or yeah, you I mean, I, I, absolutely. And I think it's, like I said, it's, it's complicated. I mean, we're very, very good at removing large scale, you know, species, right. Or removing fish from the ocean or, or species from the ocean for that matter, depending on whether we're bottom trawling or, or we're doing perthaning or long line, whatever it is. And, and some of the species in the ocean that have, have suffered greatly, right? They shouldn't, they shouldn't even be being fished sustainably. You know, when you think about sharks and uh, bluefin tuna, for example. So, um, you know, if, if it were up to me, um, you know, and I'm not sure that a lot of, 
fishing would, would be going on in the in the ocean. Um, I think that aquaculture holds some promise, but it needs to be done responsibly. Um, so I I think you know that's where where technology and science comes in is figuring out how to do things more sustainably and efficiently rather than just fishing for wild animals because um, I'm not sure that all species or certain species can reproduce quick enough to keep up with our demand, obviously. Yeah, there's a lot of people around. Um, so it is, it is a huge demand, as you're yes. saying. Also, um, change the subject a little bit. Um, <laughs> watched a clip of you, um, Cocos Island with Silver Earl. Yes. That looked an amazing trip. Uh, I mean, that, that looked such fun. But what exactly were you doing there? So um, Cocos is actually one of my very favorite places to work and dive anywhere in the world. And, and I've been fortunate to dive in all the, the oceans and, and visit so many different countries. And uh, Cocos is so unique because it's so far offshore and it's such a, a, a beautiful, beautiful place where you have a, a large population of sharks. And when I say that, um, it, a large population of sharks mean you'll see sharks on every, almost every single dive, but it's nothing compared to what it was like 50 years ago where, you know, Sylvia would, would tell me stories and others about looking over the boat and seeing hundreds of hammerheads swimming below the surface of the water. You don't, you don't see that anymore, but you might see you know, 30 or 40, 50 hammerheads in a school. And that's, that's amazing. That's super exciting. You don't get to see that in too many places in the world, maybe, you know, in the Galapagos, but um, that makes, makes Cocos special. And, and Cocos is protected. There's still illegal fishing that happens there, unfortunately. Um, and that's a whole different topic. But um, when we were there, we were helping raise awareness around the need for, uh, protected migratory corridors for sharks. And in the Eastern tropical Pacific, um, hammerheads and other species move from different areas for breeding and for feeding. So um, you might have hammerheads, for example, traveling from the Galapagos Island to Cocos Island, or maybe to Mount Palo. Um, so depending on the type of year, you may see more sharks or less sharks, but as they're kind of making their migrations between these two areas, they're, they're really vulnerable to longliners. And um, we know that the shark population worldwide is declining, and this certainly is the case for um, endangered or threatened hammerhead sharks. So um, I think by going there, raising awareness, having, um, you know, leading scientists doing research and sharing their findings um, is an important thing to do when when uh, you're out exploring the oceans, and that's what we were doing during that particular trip. Has that been televised? Is because uh, I haven't seen or heard of any of that here in the UK, for example. Yeah, so most of the work that we do is for social media um, and not for for television, and and so um, it it there have been programs that have been done on discovery and, and national geographic about this topic in, in the past. But um, most of my work has been done around, you know, raising awareness through social media, through film festivals and other, um, other means. Do you think that's, I mean, I know social media and the web is just huge now, of course, but does it still reach, the same amount of audiences as what net TV networks would do? I think, I think both are really important. Mm. And I think um, in this day and age, most of the young people, the next generation, if you will, get their, their news and information from social media. So I think it's one of the most important areas that you can target with your photography and filmmaking. Yeah, right. Oh, interesting. Interesting. Yeah. It's, um, yeah. The, the, the ways of showing your material certainly has changed over the years. Yeah. That, it that's has. Sure. I think the frustrating thing is that you can work super hard to create, you know, a, a short film and know that, you know, it, it has a short shelf life, you know, in terms of <laughs> how, how quickly it'll be forgotten about on social media. Whereas, you know, tel uh, television programming, 
you know, may have a longer shelf life, certainly if it makes it to Netflix or, you know, Prime or something like that. Yeah, that is, that is so true. I mean, you know, YouTube keeps stuff on, but, you know, it's, it's uh, yeah. audiences aren't huge. I, w- I was interested to, to hear you refer to younger generation uh, and kids. I, I do remember early in my career, uh, I went to um, a lecture by um, Lovelock, and it was about Gaia. Fabulous uh, lecture, but then right at the end, he said, it is now up to our children to protect and take care of our planet. And my head screamed, uh, <laughs> and had I had more, uh, more energy, I would have stood up and said, no, you can't say that. You know, you're in charge now. You're an adult. Yeah. You can't leave it to the children. It'll all be gone by then. Um, education, of course, is, is ultimately important for kids to learn things. But still, it's up to the adults who are in charge now. Do you find you get reactions or uh, positive reactions from adults, uh, people who are in charge, you know, governments, industry, et cetera, et cetera? Well, I think it's a mixed bag. Unfortunately, I think um, there's a certain segment of the population that cares deeply about the future of the oceans and our planet and realize that we have a responsibility now not to leave our our problems and our issues to the future generation. Um, When you think about climate change, for example, I mean, we need to be acting right now. We can't wait another 30 you know, years to, to act. So um, hopefully there's enough of us, enough of us that are responsible and realize that today is the day that we all need to work together and, and change hearts and minds before it's too late and not, you know, just hope that the next generation will be able to deal with the, the problems that we're leaving. Many, many generations of families and politicians and individuals have created, you know, kind of the mess we're in with the oceans today. And, and, you know, time is running out. We don't, we don't need to wait any longer. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and it's, it's with, with those words that, that, that I just think of people like Greta who, who are stunning. I mean, they're <laughs> amazing in the way she is in what yeah. she's doing. So um, yeah, that power yeah. to her. I, I agree. I, I, I'm so embarrassed by some of our own leaders, you know, and how they can ignore the, the obvious, you know, and unfortunately, um, I think, you know, our, our country in particular is really good at waiting until we have this urgent crisis before we act, right? And then we act like we're some kind of hero and we figure out a way to, to save ourselves, but really the most efficient and best way to save ourselves is to work diligently, you know, today and over time to make, to make a change and not wait till the last minute and hope that everything's going to be okay. These huge global systems are incredibly slow to change. Right. And um, it's taking, you know, centuries to to do what we've done to to the oceans and to our atmosphere is is, it's not going to change in five years right it's going to take a long time to repair what damages have have been done yes it is it it's um i do fear for it it's uh, a quite interesting one is is i watch um coral growing programs you know, we take a bit of coral and tie it up, and and, and I applaud the the effort uh, uh, of doing this. But the, the, it, it seems the obvious question is: okay, so you replace it. Where's all the biodiversity coming from to make that new coral sustainable and work? It's 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 gone with the original coral, uh, and I. Maybe it's just me being being a bit thick, but I don't find that I don't find there's a lot of joined up thinking 
with uh, a lot of these uh, projects that, that are happening right now. I, I, I think that these projects have a place and um, they're important in order to get people involved and to bring awareness to some of the problems that the ocean is facing today. But when we're talking about complex ecosystems and the changes and the destruction of some of these ecosystems, it's, it's hard to build something like that back to the way it was, right? Nature is, is you know, something that evolves over time. It's, it's not something where we can put one or two, three pieces in place and then hope that everything's going to return back to normal. And so um, I think that we need to do what we can do to help speed the process along and to get people engaged. But I mean, there's, you know, quite frankly, there's only so much you can do. Right. And I've seen areas like off the coast of Belize, for example, where, you know, you have to go out 25, 30 miles from shore to start to see any resemblance of a healthy reef. You're close to shore. It's all dead. It's all gone. Right. How, how do you repair something like that? You know, you can transplant, you know, coral all day long, but until you change the practices that are killing off those reefs, you're not going to change the way that area looks. Right. And it's either runoff industrial operations, <laughs> creating new ports, you know, sediment that's being churned up from dredging, whatever it is, unless you eliminate those things, you're not going to have a healthy ecosystem. No, indeed, indeed. It's it's an, it's an interesting um, uh, way that, that, that we live by filming, uh, as, as uh, I assume it's a passion as well as a job for you. It, it's, it's one way of, I find, um, getting people to take notice of the ocean. I mean, obviously you have to be in the ocean anyway in the first place, but rather than just diving over reefs or ticking off a checklist, you know, if you learn to do photography or videography, it, it suddenly makes you, or slowly makes you study a species or an environment and, uh, and an area. Um, so, uh, I find people learning to do that gradually have a bigger appreciation for the things that they want to film. Do, do you teach at all? Do you, do you, um, or are your films used in education? So um, I do a lot of lectures where, um, especially before the pandemic, yeah. um, when I would go and speak to dive clubs or at schools or, um, for larger audiences and and that obviously is a form of, of outreach and, and education um, but um, I think social media is probably the most efficient way to get the word out to a larger audience you know um, and um, I got I gotta say that being able to share impactful images um, really means the most to me um, for example, we were talking about Cocos and during one of our trips, um, we happened upon a huge, what I call kind of a river of trash that was flowing, you know, in the current past the island. And we jumped in and I did a bunch of shooting um, with Sylvia Earle and other, other team members and those images and that footage made a big, big impact and showed people that even in a marine protected area in a very remote special part of the world, you know, you can still have impacts from civilization thousands and thousands of miles away. And so those, those are the things that are important that will help educate people about really what's going on out there. You know, the turtles that are entangled, whales that are entangled, or, you know, the reef that has been completely devoid of life, you know, and unfortunately, um, the things that we don't want to see when we're out filming and diving, but they are probably the most important to share. Yeah, indeed. Kip, it's, it's been uh, brilliant talking to you. I um, appreciate it very much. Um, just uh, one thought. I mean, after all of your years and all the things that's happening now, uh, what still, what, what do you, 
like most about being underwater? What oh, really excites you and think, yes, that was fantastic? I, I think, you know, I love to explore. I mean, I just, I love jumping into the unknown and, and um, when I think about sticking my head underwater and falling towards, you know, the bottom of the ocean, I'm excited about what might show up, what might swim by, you know, on, on any given day. And I know it can be different every, t- every single time. And, and so that, that still excites me and going to new places, you know, especially very, very remote and wild places. And, um, I was fortunate enough to do some diving in the Arctic um, about two years ago. And that was, that was fascinating for me. The water was so cold. I could only hack about 30 minutes, but um, those, those types of experiences keep me going and get me really excited to wake up the next morning and go diving again. Yeah. Brilliant. Well, may, may your next diving be a, be uh exciting it's i've no idea where my next dive is um but i don't think it's going to be quite as exciting as yours uh well i'm i'm sure it's going to be great and you know thank god we're getting towards the the other side of this pandemic and i think you know won't be long before we'll be able to travel again and and dive in some of our favorite locations and um you know the ocean is still there waiting for us and um, absolutely it's kind of scary to think about what's gone on since some of us have been gone. Um, but I can tell you after just, you know, getting back from my last trip last month that um, you will feel that same exhilaration and excitement um, when you <laughs> dip your flippers back in the water. So <laughs> I think you're absolutely right. I will too. Kip, lovely. Um, thank you again. Uh, I'll say goodbye for now and um, take care. All right. Thank you so much. Thanks, Nakit. Bye. All right. Bye.